Out of billions of people on this planet, fewer than 2,000 people have made arrangements to be cryopreserved upon their clinical death. Why so few? I find this quite puzzling given that you can look around the world and find all kinds of totally bizarre ideas that have no supporting evidence whatsoever, and yet thousands of people believe in those ideas. Why does cryonics, which actually does have evidence in favor of it, it's not conclusive, but it's pretty reasonable practice, why are there so few people with cryonics arrangements? I think there are quite a few different factors. One very powerful factor, unfortunately, is simply because it's not traditional. People would actually rather die than do something radically non-traditional. They're used to the idea that when the heart stops beating, uh, they die of cancer or something like that, that that's somehow some kind of final end and they should just give up and be buried or cremated. In our view, those events are not true death. You haven't really died at that point. It's really like going into a deep coma. When you're cryopreserved, you are slowed down and stored in a way such that there's no biochemical activity and taken to a future where there's a chance that you could possibly be revived. But doing that is very non-traditional, and people are likely to think, that's kind of odd. It's an odd thing that Bob or Sally are going to do. And they may give them strange looks. They may sound very skeptical. They may even ridicule the idea. And that is a very powerful disincentive to most people. Most people are not very independent in their thinking. They want to do what other people are doing. So that's a major factor. It's true also that many people are skeptical of anything that they haven't seen working. And it's true that right now we cannot revive anybody from cryopreservation. We don't yet have the technology to do that. That's not really the critical thing with cryonics, though. What we have to do right now is to stop things getting worse. We have to prevent any deterioration in the patient's condition. More advanced technology will be required to bring these people back. But it's true we cannot today revive somebody and therefore provide that proof of principle. Also, it's true it does cost some money, much less than you might think. Most people pay for this with a life insurance policy, which especially if you start fairly young can be very inexpensive. But it does cost something. There are membership dues. And if it's an uncertain thing, people may choose not to do so. I think another very important factor is that people don't like to think about their own death. And cryonics is all about avoiding your death, taking what is actually called death, but which is actually a temporary thing, a transitional state essentially called clinical death. Still, it makes them think about the end of their life. And that's very uncomfortable. Most people don't want to think about that. In addition, cryonics is in a difficult place because Unlike, say, a religion that promises you that you're going to go to the afterlife, hopefully, uh, hopefully up there rather than down there, maybe you will go down there, in which case cryonics provides kind of an escape hatch, perhaps. But it doesn't offer any guarantees. We're not sure if cryonics will work. Even if in general it works, it might not work in your particular case. Maybe you won't be found for too long. There'll be too much deterioration. Uh, maybe you'll have an aneurysm or some other problems so we can't adequately perfuse your brain. So there's a lot of uncertainties in cryonics. And people absolutely do not like uncertainty. They want to either know for sure they're going to an afterlife, or at least believe they are, or they want to be sure and settle on the idea that that's it, they're gone. This idea that they might make it is actually very uncomfortable. Other people actually do want to do it. And they say they want to do it, but they just never get around to it. They procrastinate. We've had a couple of public figures recently saying they definitely want to be cryopreserved when they die to have a chance at coming back and yet they have not yet pursued those arrangements. So this does require certain steps, setting up the financing, the contracts, showing you understand the procedure, and so it's very easy to put that off. Many people probably just also don't like life enough to want more of it. The thing about most people who actually do go through the, with the arrangements is that they're pretty optimistic about the future. They think the life is good as it is and is likely to be good in the future, certainly enough to be worth living. But there are many people around who are unhappy, depressed, frustrated, or can't imagine a future in which they want to live. I think that's especially common now when so many people are talking doom and gloom, oddly in a world which is probably better than it ever has been, and yet people are always saying the world is coming to an end, we're all doomed, everything is going to hell. And if you project that forward and expect the future to be as it is in science fiction movies typically, a dystopia, then it's not surprising they don't want to come back. A very powerful factor as well is that people often imagine themselves coming back into the future all on their own. They think, my goodness, I don't want to be in a strange new world that I don't understand, where my skills are obsolete, where I have no friends or family. And you know what? I understand that. Fortunately, I don't think that has to be the case. If you sign up with Alcor for cryonics, 
you will probably make friends who already have these arrangements. You'll get to know other people. Uh, you can persuade your friends and family to come with you. And increasingly, we are seeing whole families sign up together. We even have three generations of families signed up together. So it's certainly not the case that you'll have to come out alone. You can make friends. You'll know people in the future. So who does actually go through with this? Who are these fewer than 2,000 people who have actually made these full arrangements? They tend to be highly educated people who understand the concepts and the process. They are not necessarily wealthy. They typically use life insurance to pay for it. And they tend to be somewhat optimistic, not unrealistically so, but believing that their life will be worth living, that they'll enjoy the future enough, the future will be good enough to be lived in. And I think that's a very reasonable assumption. If the world actually does go to hell, if things fall apart economically and socially, if people become just completely um, disrespectful of life, then we're not going to be brought back anyway. That's not the kind of world that would bring us back. Any world in which we would come back would be one with sufficient wealth and resources and goodwill that I think life would be worth living. So that's really the typical alcohol member, someone who thinks their life is not perfect, but is well worth living, well worth extending that life and coming back again.